promised earlier in the day, the panel session. And as you can see, the topic of the panel is breaching our own security. Can we keep a secret anymore? And to help us debate this issue, I've got four panelists who you can see nicely lined up there at the front. And so going from the, the far end and then towards me, we're, we have Ram Herkenaidu, an independent IT security and education specialist. We have Paul Ferrier, enterprise security architect from here at Plymouth University. We have John Finch, the information governance manager from Plymouth City Council. And Jeremy Ward, who you know from earlier on, is from Hewlett Packard Enterprise Security Services. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, being available to share your views with us today. Uh, now, part of the session, obviously, we're going to offer opportunities for questions from the floor. And when we do that, the way we'd like to play is please raise your hand and Paul, wherever he is, will come to you with a microphone so that we can all hear the questions clearly. Don't let that put you off, either the fact that Paul will come anywhere near you or that you've got to speak with a microphone. It's perfectly painless. Um, but we'll start off with a general question to the panel. Let them express some thoughts and then see where the, the mood takes us. So first question then, folks. How has the internet in general, and perhaps social media in particular, changed our culture of information sharing? And who would like to go first before I pick on somebody? Ram looks eager. Well, social media in itself wants you to share as much information as possible and it's designed for information sharing. It doesn't want you to have secrets. And if you go on to Facebook or any other social media, they want you to share all the information um, about you, but not just about you, your friends and everybody else. So it's a culture of sharing. It's not a culture of privacy. They don't want you to have privacy anymore. Anybody else? Just to, just to add on to that. <coughs> Sorry. Just to add on to that, um, the blogging side of things. So uh, there are plenty of blog sites out there and roundabout, and they're looking, the audience consuming the blog content are looking for you know everything from people who are going through various stages of cancer, so it's, it's really personal to them, um, sharing their experiences, what they're going through, all the way through to, um, you know, kids talking to each other through Instagram and uh, all of the other Twitter and Facebook. There's this, it's so easy to not think about what you're presenting because you don't know who the target audience is. Yes, okay, if you're using Facebook and you've got a closed group, then you've got some level of, of knowledge of who, who you're going to be communicating to. But on the whole, most things are developed to be open and anybody can access them. So I would suggest that everybody needs to be really cautious, but it's not something that's, that's kind of laid down to in the terms and conditions that this is how we expect you to use the system. It's, it's open to interpretation. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, my, my take on this, uh, I'm essentially addressing the question of how um, has internet and social media changed culture. Uh, when I was in school, if somebody wanted to look at my um, pictures of when I was a child, etc., you actually had to go around my house and ask my mother to see the photo albums. These days, um, my mother's actually just posted them all over the internet. So that cultural aspect has changed completely, um, which is quite scary. Um, but also there's, there's an irony where um, <clears throat> within the council we, we've had a couple of data breaches in the last few years um, where we, we've inadvertently shared people's personal data and they've tried to make compensation claims against us for breaching their privacy, etc. And yet, on the other hand, they're sharing more sensitive information than that on a daily basis um, on Facebook and all these various social platforms and don't see the, um, the irony in the fact that they, the information we've shared is less sensitive than the information they're sharing themselves. But they're viewing the um, breach that we've caused as a, a way of gaining um, financial compensation. So um, there's a lot to be addressed with the cult um, <coughs> different culture aspects 
and I don't think people realise if you put a picture on the internet how many people can actually see that without having permission and my mother definitely doesn't understand that she'll share it with the whole world with no privacy settings and um, from my point of view I might not want to have those baby photos shared yeah I think I think there's a lot of um, I think there may be a generational difference or perhaps it's just me but I personally try not to share anything with anybody uh, but that may just be me um, and I come from a culture and background where it was all secret and top secret <laughs> I still tend to have that attitude to things but uh, certainly I think my, my, my children don't really see things in the same way but the, the, the issue for me is and, and I think it, it was sort of alluded to there people don't really realize that when it's on the internet it's not only potentially everywhere but it's also potentially forever and I, I think that that's what that's what really worries me to some extent so um, I, I, I've been very interested in this right to be anonymous or this right to have um, things removed which seems like you know Canute trying to hold back the tide really I mean can you do it can you actually remove things can you actually be anonymous I don't know I mean having said that I don't like sharing stuff I'm on LinkedIn you go to LinkedIn you'll see all sorts of stuff about me there it's a trade-off you know why am I on there because I'm hoping somebody will offer me a really good job I mean even at my age um, so it's a trade-off and we haven't talked about that we're trading off privacy security secrecy against possible gain and I think that's part of the culture that perhaps we we need to uh, perhaps explore and I'd be interested to hear people's views about that trade-off which was something that uh, 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 Robert spoke about in terms of um, data protection and privacy earlier on so I'd be interested to have, hear what other people's views are on that side of the debate okay so at that point let's see if there's an opportunity for anyone to make a comment or indeed ask a further question we've got a hand up there it's convenient for you Paul When social media has arguably the potential to cause uh, damage both to people and to businesses in terms of breaches, do you feel that there's enough being done in terms of uh, forcing education on the matter? Then how would you suggest that that be increased if so? In my previous existence, I was education manager for Kaspersky, and this is one of my main issues, is the internal staff especially. We had lots of training. Well, not so much training, it's more education and awareness, because what you have to do, the technology keeps changing all the time, but the human aspect of it stays the same. We're all curious. We, we're all kind of greedy as well. There's all kind of um, psychological issues that the bad guys always try to do. So, um, for example, if you get a message saying you've won a thousand pounds or something and says open here and just check and you don't even think about you've not entered a raffle or anything like that you just open it because you want um, or for, ex for example if you get a message uh, saying that here's the uh, salary of all the top bosses in your company you might be curious to open it maybe so it's more about awareness and education for all staff and you have to go in partnership with the staff. In terms of the social media aspect, uh, you, you need to get your staff to know that they should try to do, do it responsibly. They should not be posting things which are sensitive for the company on Twitter, on Facebook. They should do it in a responsible way. 
Um, just going back to the, how do we educate people, um, one of the issues we've got is we're always playing catch up. So these technologies get introduced and nobody really knows what they're going to be used for and what they can do. So it's hard to educate people about how to use them um, when they're new technologies. And that goes back from when the first day a Windows 95 PC was put on somebody's desk and they were told to just carry on and use it and create data. Um, we started creating this massive sort of um, <clears throat> mounds of data that's completely unstructured and managed. And that's the same with social media. So it, it needs to reach a level of maturity so people can actually realise what people are doing with it and what education needs to be put in place. Because it's hard to predict what people will use different things for. For example, um, Google Plus, when they introduced that, they could have um, put lots of um, lessons learned from Facebook, but the way Google Plus um, morphed into being used was completely different than Facebook is these days, even though they started off with the intention of being the direct competitor. So it's really hard to um, try and second guess what these technologies are. All we can do is sit back, see what people have used them for, and then determine what education is needed. Actually, that, that, that's interesting because Steve and I, um, a few years ago, wrote a paper together about um, predator-prey relationships and um, the uh, uh, sort of internet and use of the internet. And the, 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 the concept is that basically the criminals, the, the, the baddie, bad guys out there, they're the predators. And as you say, the predators are always one step ahead, actually. It's not just the technology. The people who, who use the technology for bad purposes are always going to be one step ahead because it's, if you like, it, it is actually more meaningful to the predator to understand the technology and use it for their own gain than it is for the prey object to understand the technology and understand what they have to do to protect themselves. So awareness, education, great stuff, but basically you've just got, <laughs> in a sense, you've got to say, we're all prey objects. We're going to be preyed on. And the people who are preying on us are, unless you're poor, likely to know more than I am, certainly than I am, and are going to be able to use the technology far better than I can. I, I mean, that's not a counsel of despair, but it is just a fact of life, I think. And going back to, uh, is enough being done um, with regards to education? Well, um, as it's say for Internet Day, um, probably more people are aware of that now than they were probably five, six years ago, ten years ago, however long ago you want to say. Um, there are government ad campaigns now around uh, cyber streetwise, all those sorts of things. So with a central push to get more information out there that's accessible to all people. Um, it was mentioned in one of the talks earlier on by, uh, by Robert about you know, delivering uh, content to teenagers um, on a level that they will be able to understand. If we can start delivering that message consistently to the young people of the world, as well as to the people who are in their, late, their later years, um, because there's a push for more and more services to be consumed online nowadays. You know, if we can get everybody on the same page, it will make things a lot easier. Um, but the consistency of that message certainly isn't there yet. It's not a mature message that provides the right amount of information. But together, we can all, you know, collaborate, make sure that we're delivering the information in a consistent way. It will start to make a difference, but it won't be an immediate return. Any further questions from the floor? Yes, at the front there. Paul is coming with the microphone. Thank you, Paul. Uh, John, I think um, there is also an un underlying uh, point here, which is technology does not address, technology solutions does not or do not address uh, the behavior changes. Now peer pressure and working within your social group changes individual behavior, especially about the younger generation, where they will do things that are not technically correct, 
not code of practice correct, not security training correct, but they will do it for peer pressure. And social media accelerates that process. So how does the panel perceive behavior changes fitting together with technology? Because technology, if you think of Internet of Things, for example, we haven't put in the infrastructure to secure the network. We haven't put in the VPN solutions to the home environment. And we haven't put in the end-to-end -end SQL to SSL to certification systems on the Wi-Fi network to individual devices. So how are we going to maintain security end-to-end -end when we move to a more distributed in internet environment? Like most things, I think when something goes disastrously wrong, then people will start thinking about it. In the early stages of smartphones, I was talking to um, s um, networks and telling them that they should, uh, this is Roberts um, from earlier saying about baking in security. And they're not interested in that. They're interested in making money. They're interested in usability. And as consumers, that's what we're interested in. We just want to use something and be able to use it. Security is not something that we think about unless something goes wrong. But it is important for the Internet of Things, for the next generation, that these companies do think about the security. And for cars, for example, they're still not thinking about security. It's all about usability and doing something for the consumer, making it as easy as possible. Because there's always a trade-off between the security and usability. So I, I'm not very optimistic that it will happen. I think it will just happen the way everything's happened before. The usability comes first, and then security later on will, will follow. And addressing your point on how do you maintain security end-to-end -end with the Internet of Things, a system's only secure as its weakest point, and there's always going to be a weak point somewhere. So it's a very difficult um, issue to, to address, really, because somebody's always going to try and do something cheaper, and they only have to plug in one device to that connection. What about the other point about behaviour? <coughs> that, that was the other bit I was going to address, um, and really with a specific behavior aspect, you, you see um, a lot of people using the technology and there's a lot of things in the press about sexting, for example, where people are quite willingly showing um, obscene photos of themselves with whoever, and that is a definite behavior change because cameras have existed, well, for hundreds of years now, um, yet when I was a teenager, we wouldn't even think of taking a naked picture of yourself and carrying it around and showing it to people. Yeah, but that's because you had to take them to boots to be developed. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a behaviour change and just a change in the way of thinking. And I guess it's a, something that the technologists didn't perceive would happen when they introduced cameras on smartphones. I, I mean, I think essentially there are very, very few things that humans have done that have been totally game-changing in our existence as a species. People talk about the internet being a game-changer. I don't know, actually. I think the internet just enables us to do things that we have always done as humans, faster, with more people, over a wider area. I honestly don't think that it actually does anything new. We've always communicated. We are a communicating species. We're just able to do it with more people, faster, with more data. So, you know, we will do what we do as humans, and we will use whatever means is in our grasp or we can invent to do it with, basically. And I think, you know, that's one thing. And the other thing is, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. But let's hope it just doesn't bring about Armageddon. <laughs> and, and just as an addition to that, I don't know if anyone's seen the um, Steve Jobs film, the latest one, 
Probably the most interesting bit of the film was right at the start when you had Arthur C. Clarke talking about what became the internet. And this was a prediction he made in the 60s, um, maybe even earlier, where he had actually um, forecast that the, some of the human things we do uh, where we interact with people would all be done by computers. And his predictions were very accurate at the time. And it can be predicted <coughs> and, and transpose some of the human activity that we conduct on the internet. But I think there's no way he could have foreseen some of the behaviors that go on. <laughs> Let's get in with another question here um, from me. So we've talked about the various attitudes that people have and the fact that it's potentially loose perceptions of what it means to preserve confidentiality and the perhaps lack of awareness of the risks of sharing data. What do these personal practices mean then for, for businesses, for corporations, in terms of protecting their data and systems? Well, I, I mean, I think, uh, again, um, it's a great pity we haven't got Robert on this panel, actually. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think one, you know, one, one of the main things that, that, that businesses face at the moment is this sharing of um, corporate data over personal systems, personal smartphones, and so on. And it's this, this crossover um, between what is personal and what is corporate. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest issues that, uh, that, that businesses face, because people are no longer, because they're not coming into an office, switching on their desktop, using that, going home, using their personal systems. They're coming in, they're using a laptop, they're taking the laptop home, they're using that, you're using a tablet, taking it home, using that, using their smartphone, taking it home, carrying it everywhere. There's no longer that distinction. And I, I think that we're going to have to do, what we're going to have to do is make sure people understand that if you're using a corporate system, then everything, and I can't remember which speaker it was, said this, everything that you do over that corporate system has got to be belong to the corporation or belong to the organization, not to you, even if it's personal. You've got to sign away your rights, if you like, if you're using. So I've got a, I've got a smartphone here that belongs to HPE, sorry, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I, I'm not, okay, I do use it to call my wife, but I've got to recognize that if HPE wanted to intercept any text message that I sent to my wife, then they'd have the perfect right to do so because they own the system. It isn't mine. They pay the bill. They own it, if you like. And I think people have to recognize that. Um, if, on the other hand, the business wants, doesn't want people to uh, share corporate data over their own personal smartphone, they're going to have to give them a smartphone and give them that instruction. Because if they allow people to buy their own smartphone and do their own stuff in it and pay their bill, then I think, legitimately, the owner of that smartphone could say, well, I own it, I, I pay the bills, therefore anything that I do on it belongs to me. And I, I think that's, that's a perfectly reasonable trade-off, personally. It depends on the level of paranoia that you want to operate at. So if you're working for a security company or a government organization, then you need to work on a very high level of paranoia and systems have to be um, kind of locked down and people can't bring in their own devices and putting corporate data on it. If you're in an advertising agency or a, a florist or something like that, maybe you don't need that kind of level of uh, protection so you can allow your staff to bring in their own devices. Um, for me, it always starts with like a security policy, a part of the induction program when someone comes into the company, they need to know about this and they should have some like an awareness of what they can and they cannot do. If 
all their communications will be monitored, then they need to sign for it and know that this is part of the process so they don't have any comeback afterwards. So it has to be done in conjunction with between the uh, staff and the management and to agree on these things. And um, and again, it always come back to the awareness issues of what they should be able to do and what they sh should not be able to do. So just to add on to that, um, realistically, you're never going to be able to stop somebody telling a story or a pro providing a message, um, whichever way it is, to another person. So, you know, travelling home on the bus of a night time, you know, you can often hear stories of what's gone on at other people's works. You, you, can't, you can't control that through your office environment, but you can put in measures if you're allowing people to use their own devices to access corporate data, if they leave the organization to say, actually, that was a partition that's no longer accessible, we will revoke that information. It's about put in, putting in layers that are appropriate to the information that the person has access to. You're never going to be able to crack every nut with a sledgehammer, but if you can put pieces in place that prevent data leakage, that may happen, then you're in a better place than doing nothing. And uh, taking a slightly different slant on this, <clears throat> I mean, going back to the, the Steve's actual question of what do personal practices means for, mean for business, businesses protecting data, a um, good personal example that I have, a few years ago I had an operation, um, all the medical data around that operation is protected by the NHS. Um, they don't know the exact figure, but there'll be a, an amount that's spent on protecting that piece of data to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of um, unauthorised people. Yet I actually shared information about that operation um, openly on the internet and quite happy to do so just in case um, anyone else experienced the same symptoms. So the NHS are experiencing an overhead of protecting that data when I've actually allowed it out in the, out in the open and made that personal decision myself. And we can see quite a few years in the future, we might actually get around to adopting a similar um, stance to one of the Baltic states, which has been introduced a data passport. So the citizen is actually going to be in um, total control of all their personal data. So they would have all their medical records. And if a doctor needed access to those, then they would give consent and give access at that time. So that's the way this could eventually move. Um, but there needs to be um, a big change in people's attitude and understanding of what it means to them to be able to protect that data. And it will actually reduce costs for businesses on what they need to protect, but they'll need to spend money in other ways of how they access it and how they make sure they access it appropriately and um, have all the due diligence and governance around that side of things. But that, that's, we're talking 10, 20 years in the future for that. Opportunity for any further questions, comments from the floor. Thank you. I think what I would say is uh, largely just being covered, but I perceive a particular difficulty in understanding between the provision of security, which I do for my organisation, and privacy, which an individual needs to do for themselves, and the idea of keeping a secret um, as opposed to keeping personal data. How does the panel see um, the social networking generation understanding the difference between security and privacy and secrets and personal data in the future? My feeling about um, privacy and security is that actually privacy is, is almost something that comes out of a combination of security and transparency. So, as long as you, everybody, all sides, are being transparent about what is happening with the data, and there is therefore generated a mutual trust, if you like, around what is happening to that data, and you feel therefore, as a result, of that transparency and that 
developed trust that the data is being held securely, then I think you should be reassured about privacy. That seems a little bit perhaps um, idealistic. It's a, it's a very big if, I agree. But, I mean, you, you can see, I mean, this, this uh, you know, I like this idea of the, of the um, passport, the personal passport. That, that seems to me to be a step on the, on the road to that transparency and that development of trust. Um, but, yes, I mean, it, it, it is a question of trust, really, isn't it? It, 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 it always has been. Person, uh, sorry. I have a mic Okay, wait for the microphone in that case, and then we'll. Sorry. Here it is. I'm not a great believer, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy uh, in having digital passports. Because government organizations, from my experience, are the worst ones for the leaky bucket. They're the most guilty and suspect. And the more regional uh, government organizations we have, the easier the leak. So digitizing your personal medical history is, for me, the road to Armageddon because it's going to allow the insurers to eventually see the accurate profile of your medical history and hit you with extortionate premiums because they're just waiting for it to happen. Um, the, the point about the digital passport is that it's not put in the hands of government organizations to hold. You actually hold all of your data in a secure format, and you hand it over. When you exchange it, it's out of your control. Who's to say you actually have to exchange it? They might just have an API into that data to access the specific bits they need. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. I'm very <laughs> um, But Vaz was just going to address the last question. Right, going back to your to point there. If someone comes into the work and is accessing data on the corporate network, and as long as they've signed the security policy, the HR policy, saying that all data in the business is monitored or uh, will be monitored, then they can't expect a right to privacy during the workplace using corporate data uh, or c corporate devices. Obviously, if they have their own smartphones and they're connecting up to Wi-Fi or on thing, then they should have some kind of pri privacy on that, on their personal devices. But any corporate uh, dev devices going over, you know, during business hours, if it's be the data is being monitored and um, being held as well for later investigations for whatever reason, then that's completely legitimate. I th I'll, I'll tell you what worries me, and this is a sort of philosophical worry, I think. Um, I think we're losing the ability to disappear. That's what worries me. I've, I've, I've had this experience recently because my, my daughter and her family have just moved back to the UK just for a year um, and just trying, just trying to get them registered so that they can rent a property, so that they can get the internet into that property, so that they can... Um, buy a car honestly the you know the interconnectedness of identities and and things is really worries me I, I've just sort of seen that in practice and I just wonder you know how do you go off grid if you want to I think we all ought to have the right to go off grid if we want to and I think we're losing that, and we're, we're, we're going to lose that. And that, that really worries me. But as I say, that's a bit of an esoteric and philosophical problem. But seriously, I am worried that none of us in the future are going to be able to go off grid. <laughs> and, and sometimes you might not have a choice. It could be someone else sharing the data about you. Yeah. But going back to the original point, we use the terms security and privacy. 
almost interchangeable and, and that, that's one of my big issues everyone always talks about security in terms of just confidentiality when integrity and availability are just as important and in some cases can be far more crucial than integrity so if you've got the wrong information and you're treating a patient you can actually put their life at risk um, and that's far greater risk than sharing that information with unauthorized people yeah, okay I'll ask another question of you so looking ahead if this is a problem that organizations are having to face because they've got people who can't differentiate between data that should and shouldn't be shared, is this a problem ultimately we should be expecting organizations in the future to continue to have to solve? Or is this something that perhaps we could hope moves back into school level education or other awareness raising initiatives? So Paul, I think, mentioned earlier things like Cyber Streetwise and Get Safe Online and some of these other campaigns. How much success do we think we're likely to see moving forward from this wider awareness landscape? I think the, the quick answer to that is only time will tell. Um, I'd like to think that it would be um, a benefit moving forwards, but um, as kind of alluded to earlier on, it needs to be tackled from multiple different angles. Um, the government campaigns, while they're good, how many people see that it's coming from the government, therefore maybe it's not going to be something that I'm going to go and do in my spare time. If we can target young people, then talking about um, Henrik was talking earlier on about inculcating this sort of information from an early age. If you can get people to change the way that they think about how they are going to do things, surely that's the best way to make a marked difference in the future. But um, it does involve everybody to be thinking along the same sort of lines, which isn't easy. And you're only really going to be able to get 80% of the people. There's always going to be um, some people that will not listen to the message no matter how many times you tell them. And, and that's just the nature of society. I think everyone knows and fully understands that um, we've got a 30 mile hour speed limit in built up areas. But now and again, we break those rules and um, don't pay attention to the signs. So you're never going to get this fully addressed. I, I mean, I think to, to some extent, you know, having been for the last 16 years employed, somewhat employed or more or less employed by various um, vendors that are involved in um, information security, I, I think that the security industry has got a lot to answer for, actually, because we really should be making security more simple than insecurity, because, as you say, you know, you can't reach all the people. So why don't we make it easier to do security? You know, I, I don't know. What, because I suspect the vendors like selling lots of new kit to people. And it's, it's almost like a conspiracy. You know, there's a new problem, you need a new magic bullet to solve it, you know. Today's issue is, you know, advanced persistent threats. Therefore, you need lots of new solutions for advanced persistent threats, you know. It, next year it'll be something else, this year it'll probably be something else. I think advanced persistent threats are getting a bit old now. So there'll be something new. So we need something new. We need something more complicated. We need, to, it, you know, why can't we make it easier instead of more difficult, more complicated, putting new patches on all over the place. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> um, I think one of the, one of the issues are, uh, is that IT is still a very immature um, service. T take the comparison to the car industry. Cars have been around for about 100 years. Even in the 70s, a lot of cars were death traps. Um, Formula One races, there's a very good chance that they would die in a race. But yet these days, um, safety is actually built into cars and they've got the maturity where they actually build it into the designs and it's there by design but it took about a hundred years to get there and a long time and it took a while for the prices and, and to be cost effective but now it's something we expect and I think we, we haven't 
got into that way of thinking about the IT industry yet. Okay, comment from the floor. Right beside you, Paul. Um, I think there's a, a danger of making security too easy because you have um, tools like um, onion routing, uh, strong encryption and proxy chains that almost guarantee that we can keep secrets. And while that's extremely valuable to organizations protecting intellectual property or activists or anyone who's persecuted, it's, it can almost completely hamper investigations into crimes as well. So as well as can we keep a secret, should we be keeping secrets to that level? That's, that's a good one. I like that one. And, and it, it, it comes back to my um, philosophical point about your right to be off grid. <laughs> now, for 18 years, <laughs> I was a policeman. <laughs> and I would have said, oh, we don't want people to go off grid. <laughs> For the last 16 years, I've been not a policeman, <laughs> exactly. And I'm coming more and more to believe that everybody ought to have the right to go <laughs> off-grid and to be private. And we ought to get the balance right between the ability to investigate and the ability to, to, to be anonymous don't know what the answer is exactly, but there's got to be a balance. Um, for me, uh, having strong encryption, being able to be like what you say, uh, to go off grid is really important. And we should have the, be able to have private communications with people without being, uh, having surveillance. Now in terms of investigation, having strong encryption doesn't stop you from investigating um, the one thing I don't like is this, we have to have all the information from everything to be able to then be able to investigate the bad guys. That's not the way it works, I don't think. Even if we have strong encryption, if you have intelligence-led um, surveillance, like you have targeted people that you want to surveil, even if they're using encryption, you are able to put it something on their device because while they're using the system it will be in clear text and then it will get when it's transmitting that's when it does encryption so if you got something onto their device you can still monitor what they're doing so to me it's like a red herring where this thing like you either have to have strong encryption or you are able for the police and intelligence services to be able to to be able to monitor these people. Uh, the two things didn't happen. Um, and even if they were able to have back doors into encryption system, that's not going to help because if you go back to November, what happened in France, the bad guys, they were sending messages by text messaging, not just strong encryption, and they weren't being picked up. So if that's happening now, just being able to be able to um, for people not being allowed to use strong encryption, that's not going to help, I don't think, personally. Okay, folks, we're running towards the end of our time now, and coffee is looming. So just to bring us to a graceful conclusion, if I could ask you, each of the panel members, for a top tip or top thing that you'd like to be able to address in this space to make a difference, and brief answers in all cases so we finish on schedule, starting with Ram, please. For me, it's about awareness. This is for young people, for everybody. You just make them aware of the issues around security and then for them to make their own decisions because everyone will be slightly different. So awareness raising about the issues. Paul? Oh. Just to add on to that, um, if you can look after your information sensibly and properly at home, why can't you do it everywhere else? John? Um, I think the key is empowering people to take control of their own data and be able to make informed decisions on where it is and who accesses it. Finally, yep, um, I would agree, but I mean, to me, it was something Henrik said earlier, 
It's about risk. It's about assessing the risk, making a reasonable, rational decision, having assessed the risk. What is the risk of doing it, as opposed to the risk of not doing it? What is the risk of putting a data here, as opposed to not putting the data here? We make risk decisions all the time. We should be making much more rational risk decisions about our data and how we use uh, the internet and how we use social media. And that, it comes down to awareness, but it's understanding risk and how you take it sensibly. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd join me in thanking the panel for their contributions.